Okay, this is 2019, higher paper one. I'm going to talk through all the solutions so you can see exactly how you would work through it. Question one, find the x coordinates of the stationary points on the curve with equation y equals a half x to the four, take away two x cubed plus six. Okay, to find stationary points, we just differentiate it and put it equal to zero. So we're going to do dy by dx. Now multiply the half by 4 and we'll get 2. Lower the power by 1. We get 2x cubed. Now 2 times 3 is 6. Keep the minus in. And lower the power by 1. And when we differentiate 6, that goes to 0. Now we have to mention that we're going to put d by dx equal to 0 for stationary points or whatever your abbreviation is for that. So 2x cubed minus 6x squared equals 0. At this point, we just factorise. We can take out a highest common factor of 2x squared. And we just put both equal to 0. So if 2x squared equals 0, then x would have to be 0. And if x minus 3 equals 0, x would have to be 3. And you were just asked for the x coordinates. If you had to find the full coordinate, you'd have to substitute back into the original y equals equation. Okay, the, this equation is equal roots, and we have to determine the possible values of k. So this is just a discriminant question. And equal roots means it will equal zero. If it says real roots, you would do greater than or equal to zero, but this just says equal roots. So this is nice and easy. I always write my a, b, c value down the side. So my a value is the coefficient of x squared, which is just one. The b value is your coefficients of x, which is k minus five. And c is everything else, which is just one. So we'll do k minus 5 all squared minus 4 times a times c. So if we multiply that out, we're going to get k squared minus 10k plus 25. And minus 4 times 1 times 1 is just minus 4. Now tidy that up. 25 minus 4 is plus 21. Seven and three make 21, so when we factorize, it'll just be k minus seven, k minus three, and put both equal to zero. So k equals seven, or k equals three. Okay, in this question, we've been given the equation of circle one, circle C1, and we've been told the center of circle C2 is four, negative two, I'll write that over the side. So that's the center of C2. Find the equation of the circle C2, and we're told that the radius of C2 is equal to the radius of C1. So our first step is to go find the radius of C1. So let's write down what 2g and 2f and c equal. So 2g is the coefficient of x, 2f is the coefficient of y, and c is the negative 26 at the end. So g equals negative 3, f equals negative 1, and our c will stay as negative 26. So the radius of that C1 circle is g squared plus f squared minus c. So negative three all squared plus negative one all squared plus 26, because if you take away a negative, you will add. Okay, that gives us 36 when we add that all together. So square root of 36 is six. So our equation of the circle is in the form x minus a all squared plus y minus b all squared equals radius squared. That's our center, that's our radius, and we're just gonna plug that into the formula. So it's
x minus 4 all squared plus y plus 2, just be careful of the negative, equals 6 squared. Now we do have to tidy that up. You do not have to expand out the square brackets, but you do have to square your radius. So your final answer is x minus 4 all squared plus y plus 2 all squared equals 36. Okay, this is a recurrence relation for question 4. We are told the first three terms of the equation are 6, 9, 11, so I've written them over the side. Um, let's make up equation. So u3 would be m u2 plus c. And we know our u3 is 11, so 11 equals 9m plus c. u2 would equal m u1 plus c, so that means 9 would equal 6m plus c. Okay, so now I'm just going to write both equations side by side so we can do simultaneous equations. Call that equation 1, call that equation 2. The c value are both 1c, so we don't need to multiply either of the equations by anything. We can simply just subtract. So I'm going to do equation 1, subtract equation 2. 11 take away 9 is 2. 9 take away 6 is 3, so 2 would equal 3m, so m would equal 2 thirds. Using our equation 9 equals 6m plus c, and we know m equals 2 thirds, we can substitute that in to find our c value. So 9 equals 6 times 2 thirds plus c. 6 times 2 thirds is the same as 2 thirds of 6. 2 thirds of 6 would be 6 divided by 3 is 2, 2 twos are 4, so 9 equals 4 plus c, therefore c would have to equal 5. So that's us find the values of m and c. That was for 4a. 4b is calculate the fourth term of the sequence. So remember u4 would have to be u, m u3 plus c. And we know our m is 2 thirds. We know our u3 is 11. And we know our c is 5. So 2 times 11 is 22. 22 over 3 plus 5. And that will give us Right, well, 22 over 3, uh, 3 goes into 21, or 22, 7 times remainder 1. So that's 7 and a third plus the 5, which is 12 and 1 third. Or you could write that top heavy, which would be 37 over 3. So the answer for 4b is 12 and 1 third. Okay, this question we have to show that a, b and c are collinear. That just means they lie in a straight line. So what we have to show is we have to show that AB is parallel to BC and because B is a common point then they must lie on a straight line if this is the case. So AB is just B minus A which is 4 minus 1, 0 Subtract 1, 5, minus 3. So 4 take away 1 is 3. Minus 1 take away 5 is minus 6. 0 take away negative 3 is positive 3. Right, now let's do BC. So BC is C take away B. Okay, you take away 4 is 4. <coughs> minus 9. Take away a negative 1 means add 1, so negative 8. And 4 take away 0 is 4. Right, we want to take out a common factor so that the components both look the same. So if we take out a 3 here, we'll get 1, negative 2, 1. And if we take out a 4 here, we'll get the same, 1, negative 2, 1. Okay, so from the previous page, A, B is 3 lots of 1, negative 2, 1. And BC is 4 lots of 1, 
negative 2 in. So what we can say, basically they're a multiple of each other, so therefore they're parallel. Okay, so what we can say is that 3 lots of BC equals 4 lots of AB. I like doing it this way rather than using fractions so that I can clearly see what the ratio is, because the ratio in part B is going to be 3 to 4. So we've worked out part B already by doing it this way. So I basically just swap the numbers. So 3 lots of BC would equal 4 lots of AB. So just remember that you can just swap the numbers about and that will work. So 3BC equals 4AB. So therefore AB and BC are parallel. Since B is also a common point, A, B and C are collinear. So you have to explain yourself well in a sentence. So just show that they're a multiple of each other and that will explain why they're parallel then because they share a common point, they have to be collinear. Okay, part B, like I said, we've already actually solved it. Because it's 3BC equals 4AB, the ratio that B divides AC will just be 3 to 4. Okay, we have Y equals 1 over 1 minus 3X to the power of 5. Make sure we bring that up. We don't want to have it on the denominator. So that will be negative 5 as the power. Now we're going to differentiate, so just multiply and subtract, so multiply the negative 5 down, keep the bracket the same, lower the power by 1, so that become negative 6, and then times by the bracket differentiated, which would be negative 3. Tidy that up, 15, 1 minus 3x to the power of negative 6. Now I like to tidy it up, because we were given it nice and tidy in the question, so rather than leaving it as a negative power, I'm going to tidy it up nice and put it back down there and give it a positive power. So 15 over 1 minus 3x all the power of 6. Question 7. Anytime you see positive direction of the x-axis, it's an m equals tan theta question. So let me read it. The line L makes an angle of 30 degrees with the positive direction of the x-axis. Find the equation of the line perpendicular to L passing through 0, negative 4. So it's not going to have the same gradient as this, it's going to be perpendicular to it. So we'll do m equals tan 30. And from your exact values table, you should know that is 1 over root 3. Perpendicular gradient to that would be negative root 3. Remember to flip your fraction upside down and change its sign. And we should explain that it's because m1 times m2 equals negative 1. Okay, we're just going to do y minus b equals mx minus a. We know our gradient is the perpendicular gradient. We know our coordinate is 0, negative 4. So let's substitute that in. So 0, or y plus 4 equals negative root 3, x minus 0. So y plus 4 equals negative root 3, x. And I'm going to subtract my negative 4 on the other side. And that's us find the equation of the line L. Okay, in 8a, we're just asked to express the shaded area enclosed between the two curves as an integral sign. So I've set it up already. It's just upper minus lower. And they've kindly given us the points of intersection of both graphs, which is 2 and negative 1. Put the negative in there. So between 2 and negative 1. To find out which one's upper and which one's lower, imagine the shaded area is sand. And if you remove the lower curve, the sand would fall to the ground. But if you remove the upper one, there might just be a little bit of movement. It's not going to totally fall out of the bottom. So the bottom curve is clearly 2x squared plus x plus 1. So that's why I've put that second. So it's upper curve minus lower curve. Now you have to tidy that up. So let's just take away the bracket. x squared minus 2x squared is minus x squared, 2x minus x is plus x, and 3 minus 1 is plus 2. And that's us done part A. Okay, this is part B, so we're just going to work out that integral, so let me write it back up again. So we're going to integrate all of that with respect to x, 
Okay, so it's minus x cubed over 3 plus x squared over 2 plus 2x. And we're going to put that in a square bracket because we've integrated now. Sorry, I keep on forgetting that negative 1. Pop that negative 1 back in. Okay, so now we're just going to substitute the 2. And then the negative 1 in the next bracket. Just make sure negatives go in their own little bracket so you don't forget. Because sometimes that will work out positive if it's a squared. So 2 squared is 4 over 2, which is 2. Minus 1 cubed is negative, but there's a negative at the front, so that'll be 1 third. Negative 1 squared is positive. Okay. Six plus two is eight. Negative eight thirds take away another third is take away nine thirds, take away a half. Nine thirds is three. So let's go over here. Eight take away three, take away a half, means five take away a half, which is four and a half. So the answer is four and a half units squared. Okay, find an expression for u dot v. If you're given the components, we just multiply the first two components together, the middle two components together, and then the last two components together and add them. So you would do p times 2p plus 16 plus minus 2 times minus 3 plus 4 times 6. Okay, so that'd be 2p squared plus 16p plus 6 plus 24, which is 2p squared plus 16p plus 30. So that's 9a part 1. Part 2. Determine the values of p for which u and v are perpendicular. You should know that u dot v will equal 0 when they're perpendicular. So all we're going to do is put 2p squared plus 16p plus 30 equal to 0 and solve it. You'll notice they all divide by 2, so let's divide everything by 2 to make it easier to factorise. If it equals 0, you can always do that. You can always divide every term and get rid of it. Okay, so 3 fives are 15. So p plus 3 equals 0 or p plus 5 equals 0. So p equals negative 3 or p equals negative 5. And that's us done 9a. Determine the value of p for which u and v are parallel. If they're parallel, they have to be a multiple of each other. So if I'm looking at the bottom two numbers, the 4 and the 6, the second one has to be 6 fourths bigger, if you like. So 6 fourths is 3 over 2. So what that would mean is 3 over 2 times p would have to equal 2p plus 16. If I'm looking at the first part of the components in each the first part in each component, okay? So 3 over 2 of p must equal the 2p plus 16. So 3p equals, let's multiply the 2 up to the other side. So 3p equals 4p plus 32. And I'm going to move the 32 to the left and move my 3p to the right. So p equals negative 32. And I'll just rewrite that. So that's the value of p for which u and, p, u and v are parallel. Okay, number 10. You can see that the graph is upside down and it's been moved up. So the k value is going to be negative, but it's not just going to be a negative 1. We'll figure that out in a little minute. Um, but to figure out how much it's been moved up, look at the 0, the origin, because if you multiply anything by zero, it's going to stay zero. So that, that from that, we'll be able to work out our a value. So if it's been flipped upside down and it's still at zero, it must have been moved up three to end up at zero, three. So our a value is just three. To get the k value, we know it's negative. Let's look at the two, negative one. The two, negative one has moved to two, five. But we know it's been moved up three. So if we subtract 3 from this, we're going to get 2, 2. 
So it's been moved upside down. You would expect the 2 negative 1 to go to 2, 1. So what's happened between the 1 and the 2? How do we get from 1 to 2? Multiplying by what? By multiplying by 2. So our k value is going to be negative 2. So that's because it's been turned upside down and then the y value has multiplied by 2 before we added the 3 on to move it up. So a equals 3, k equals negative 2. Okay, question 11, we just need to evaluate this integral. Okay, if we integrate it, we get sine, keep the bracket the same, divide by the bracket differentiated. Or you can bring the third to the front as well. I might actually do that this time, make it not take up as much room. So it'll be a third sine 3x minus pi. We'll put our square bracket on because we've integrated, put our pi over 9 and our 0 at the side, and then just substitute that in. 3 pi over 9, obviously that can be simplified, we'll do that in a wee minute. Okay, so this will just be pi over 3, take away pi over 6. And sine of negative pi over 6, that's going to be in the fourth quadrant. We'll work that out in a wee minute. Okay, so 1 third pi, take away 1 sixth pi, would just be 1 sixth pi. So 1 third sine pi over 6 subtract 1 third sine okay I'll just keep the minus pi over 6 in just now okay so that'll be a third times a half pi over 6 is the same as 30 degrees and sine 30 is a half if you're like me and you memorize everything in degrees um, so I can always convert back when I'm trying to figure that out Okay, minus pi over 6. Let's do a little cast diagram over the side. So minus pi over 6 is going to end up in the fourth quadrant. So sine is negative. If you think of your quadrants. Sine is negative in the fourth quadrant. So sine of pi over 6 is a half. So sine of negative pi over 6. It's going to have the same acute angle, but it's going to be negative. So negative a half. So that's just 1 sixth plus 1 sixth, which is 2 sixths, which is 1 third. So 1 third is our final answer for question 11. f of x is 1 over root x. This is question 12a. And g of x is 5 minus x. Okay, we're asked to find f of g of x. There is a mark for showing this step here, f of minus 5 minus x, basically just popping the g of x in a bracket after the f, so remember to do that. And then all we do is replace that bracket where the x is in the f function. So the f function is 1 over root x, so we just do 1 over root and then we pop, pop that bracket in its place. And that's us done 12a. 12b. State the range where it's undefined. Well, you know that uh, square root has to be positive. So 5 minus x would have to be greater than 0, which means 5 is greater than x, which means x is less than 5. But be careful, that's not the answer. You were asked when would it be undefined. Okay, so x less than 5 is a suitable domain. So undefined will just be the opposite of that. So our answer is x greater than or equal to 5. Okay, this is question 13. Um, we've got triangles. We can use Pythagoras to find any missing sides. So for the first triangle, root 5 squared would be 5 minus 1 squared would give us 4. And square root that will get 2. Now on the diagram, you'll see that the bigger triangle is just 2 plus 1 for this side because it's got one extra unit 
in length. So that is three, or you can just do the Pythagoras again if you wish. Right, for part A, they're just asking us for cos P and cos Q. But we're also going to need to find sine P and sine Q for part B. So I'm going to still do that over the side. So sine P and sine Q, because we'll, we'll need those answers for, the, for part B. But for part A, cos P is, remember your Sokotoa. So let me write that out somewhere, Sokotoa. Okay, so cos is ka, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cos P is, the adjacent would be 2, and the hypotenuse would be root 5. So 2 over root 5. Cos Q would be 3 over root 10 because it's adjacent over hypotenuse. Sine P is opposite over hypotenuse and sine Q is opposite over hypotenuse as well. So one over root 10 would be your sine Q and one over root five would be your sine P. That won't get you any marks for part A, but you're gonna need it in part B. Okay, so for part B, it's sine P plus Q. And we just get this off the formula sheet. It's the sine expansion. So it's sine P cos Q plus cos P sine Q. And we pop in what we know. So it's 1 over root 5 times 3 over root 10 plus 2 over root 5 times 1 over root 10. So 3 root 50 plus 2 root 50 is 5 over root 50. This can be written as 5 over root 25 times root 2 which is 5 over 5 root 2, and the 5s will cancel, so 1 over root 2. If you wish, you could rationalise the denominator and leave your answer as root 2 over 2. Number 14, evaluate log 4 to the base 10 plus 2 log 5 to the base 10. Okay, so we can bring our 2 up. So that'll be 5 squared, which is going to be 25. Our rule of logs, we can multiply if we're adding logs together. So 4 25s are 100. And from this point, you can see that 10 squared equals 100. So the answer to that is just 2. Okay, this is 14b. We're going to solve this log equation. So as you'll notice, the base is 2, but 5 does not have a log on it. So we need to make the 5 have a log with base 2. Now you should know that log 2 to the base 2 makes 1. So we can just multiply the 5 by log 2 to the base 2. If it was a base 3, we would do log 3 to the base 3. If it was log 4, we'd do log 4 to the base 4, and so on. So you want the logs to have the same base. On this left-hand side, when we're combining them, if there's a subtract, we divide. That's just one of our laws of logs. So log to the base 2 of 7x minus 2 divided by 3 equals 5 log 2 to the base 2. Now, we can't cancel out the logs yet because we have a 5 at the front, so we need to deal with that. So let's bring the 5 up as a power. 2 to the power of 5 is 32. So that will be log 32 to the base 2. We'll write the left-hand side back in. OK, at this point, we're able to cancel off the logs because we've just got one log on both sides and there's no numbers at the front. And now we just multiply up the 3 by 32. So 7x minus 2 equals 96. So if 7x minus 2 equals 96, then 7x will equal 98. Just add the 2 onto the other side. And then all we'll do at this point is the divide through. So x equals 14. If you ever get two solutions, just give the positive answer. You'll have, you'll have one negative answer and one positive answer. You would just score off the negative answer because x has to be greater than zero on a log graph. So if you get two solutions ever, just score off the negative one. Okay, we've got 15a and it solve this equation between zero and 360. 
Now sine 2x on your formula sheet is 2 sine x cos x. Just take out your highest common factor, which is 2 cos x. So it'll be sine x plus 3. And I would just put both brackets equal to 0. So 2 cos x equals 0. And sine x plus 3 equals 0. So cos x equals 0. Or sine x equals negative 3. That's not a solution because sine would have to be between 1 and negative 1. So we'll just write not a solution. But make sure you show it. Show it and then lightly score it off and explain it's not a solution. And then we're just going to give our answer for cos x equals 0. If it equals 0, 1 or minus 1, I just look at the cosine curve. So when it's a cosine curve equal to 0, it's equal to 0 at 90 degrees and 270. That's where it cuts the y-axis, or the x-axis, sorry. So x equals 90 degrees and 270 degrees. If that was in radians, just make sure you put that into radians. Right, part B. It says... Now solve sine 4x plus 6 cos 2x equals 0. Now this is only worth one mark. So this is easy. We don't have to do much more work. We've done all the work in part A. If you look at the angles, you'll notice the angles are double in part B. So it's like putting 2x equal to 90 and 270. But we can add 360 on because when we divide those by 2, we're going to end up with just 45 degrees and 135, 135 degrees. So we've still got room for two more answers. So let's add 360 on to 90 degrees and we get 450. And then one more time, we get 630 degrees. So if we divide those by 2, we get 225 and 315 degrees. Okay, so the answer to part B is 45 degrees, 135 degrees, 225 degrees, and 315 degrees. Okay, this is question 16a. We're trying to show the distance between C and P is that special square root they've given us. So the centre C is 1, negative 2, and the coordinate of P is 4K. So let's just use our distance formula to find the distance between them. So I'm going to label this x1, y1, x2, y2, and then we're ready to do our distance formula. So the distance from P to C is the square root of x2 minus x1 all squared plus y2 minus y1 all squared. So that's 4 minus 1 all squared. plus k plus 2 because of the double negative. Okay, so 3 squared plus k squared plus 4k plus 4 if you expand out that double bracket. And we can tidy that up. So 3 squared is 9. 9 plus 4 is 13. So we'll start with the k squared first. And that is exactly what you've been shown. So I'm just write as required, we've worked it out, and we've got what they asked. Okay, hence or otherwise, find the range of values of k such that p lies outside the circle. The radius is 5. If you look at the circle equation, it says x minus 1 all squared plus y plus 2 all squared equals 25. So if you square root 25, you get 5. So the radius is 5 of that circle. So the distance between P and C would have to be greater than 5 for P to lie outside that circle. So we're just going to put that square root that we worked out in part A greater than 5. So to get rid of the square root, just square the other side and bring everything to the left. And that will factorise nice. That's just going to be a K plus 6, K minus 2. Now to solve this, we'll need to sketch it. So I'm going to put the brackets equal to zero just to find the roots. So k is negative six or k is two. It's a happy face because it was a positive k squared.
Okay, so the roots are negative 6 and 2, and we're looking to see when that is above 0. So it's above 0 to the left of negative 6, which, we, which means k is less than negative 6, and to the right of 2, which means k is greater than 2. So that's when p would lie outside the circle, when k is less than negative 6, or k greater than 2. Okay, we're going to express this in the form p plus q sine rx and pq and r all integers. So all we do is expand this out. So I'll actually write it out twice so we can see it. Okay, the first term is sine x times sine x. I use the FOIL method. You can use a separating method if you like. But sine x times sine x is sine x all squared or sine squared x. The outside is sine x times cos x. So the first terms are here, the outside terms are here, the inside terms are here, which is minus sine x cos x, and the last terms is minus cos x times minus cos x, which is plus, plus cos x all squared. Okay, if we join that together, we get sine squared x plus cos squared x minus 2 sine x cos x. Now you'll notice sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1, hopefully, from your trig identities. And you should also know that 2 sine x cos x is sine 2x. So it's just 1 minus sine 2x. And I'll write that over the side. So sine squared, the reason we got that answer was sine squared plus cos squared equals 1 and 2 sine x cos x equals sine 2x. So we should know those two statements. So our answer to 17a is 1 minus sine 2x. Okay, now we're asked for the integral of sine x minus cos x all squared with respect to x. So what we're going to do is replace what we've just found out in A. So we, we know that sine x minus cos x all squared is 1 minus sine 2x. And we can integrate that. So let's do that. Integrate 1 with respect to x will just give us 1x. Integrate sine. We get cos. Well, we get a neg. If we integrate sine, we're going to get a negative cos. But there's a negative already there. So that's going to go to a plus cos. Keep the bracket the same. So we're really imagining that 2x is in a bracket. Keep the bracket the same and divide by the bracket differentiated, which is divide by 2, and then put our plus c on. And we can just write that as a little half at the front. So a half cos 2x, we just drop the bracket at that point, plus c. And that's the answer to 17b. And that's the end of paper 1 for 2019.